Yes, everyone, you know what time it is. It's your boys, Jack and Dave here, joined by Mia. And this needed to happen a long time ago, but we picked a good week. Very hectic, very dramatic week. I think with lots of different things to chat about. And Mia, we finally have you on from Spurs Between the Lines. Do check it out, everybody. It's in the comments as well as in the description. How are you, Mia? Finally have you on for the podcast. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure, obviously, because I've had you guys on mine a couple of times. So, yeah, it's lovely to be here. Returning the favor, Dave. And uh, Harry Kane news, as well as, like, La Celso, plenty of uh, Romero. I think we're going to be chatting about plenty of players today, so... Uh, how are mm. you, Dave? I'm absolutely fantastic. You know, the, the, the whole, um, what would you say, the news around Kane is starting to shift my way, which I absolutely adore. And, uh, you know, the Romero news coming out, that Romero's just as committed as, um, you know, we thought he was, Jack. So two great bits of news recently, and uh, it makes me happy. Yeah, definitely. It's good news, uh, and uh, for sure. And also as well, everybody, we have plenty of news to get into. So if you haven't already, mm. do hit that like button, because I feel like we got to get straight into it and i think we might as well just kind of start with you know what needs to happen between now and deadline day because me myself included and plenty of uh you know spurs fans are very frustrated by all of the you know lack of you know kind of business that's been happening there's been no outgoings really officially other than uh the harry winks the Kane situation has been kind of you know making some leeway but we're not really fully there yet and then the incomings especially in the center back department certainly have not come in so mia i guess we'll start with you and just kind of ask you, where would you start if you were basically in Scott Munn's role? Let's say you were maybe Perachichi right now behind the scenes or something like that. What would you do the first thing? Would you be starting with the outgoing, starting with the incomings, or maybe fixing the Harry Kane situation? Do you know what? I think that it's a lot more um, complex than maybe people think. I'm not trying to make excuses, but the fact is that we have got a lot of players at the moment and I feel like that we definitely need to get rid of them not because of the money because we need the money but I feel like that just numbers wise because if we carry on getting players in we're going to end up with a 50-man squad at some point like we're going to have just way too many it's like hold on a second we're going to need name badges for all of them to know who the hell they all are because um, Andrew's bless him he's going to forget all their names so I do understand about that people want players in but on the other hand i also understand the whole um complexity of possibly needing them out but if i was scott munn i would have these players lined up the ones that have only got a year left on their contract and i would say can we make an agreement to rip up your contract you can we rip up your contract would you agree to that and that's the sort of thing i personally think should be done i know it has to be agreed by the player as well but I feel like that we need to maybe get some of these people off our books to be able to get those other ones in ASAP because I feel yeah. like that's important. Also, the ones that we have got that have got um, suitors, people who want them, let's make a deal. Come on, get it done. Yeah. Chop, chop, chop. Just get it done. And if we have to lose a bit of money, see like Endon Bella, apparently they're going to up their bid for him at Galatasaray. Is it Galatasaray? I think you, yeah, um, yeah, yeah you're right. So they're going to up it to 10 million euros. Listen, I know it's a lot of money we've lost. It is a hell of a lot of money we've lost. But don't forget, his wages is a big bill. So we could actually use some of that money that we would have used on wages on sure. players, if that makes sense. Because the way the pay players are coming in, it's unlikely their wages are going to be as big. So we have mm -hmm. to kind of do stuff like that. We have to get this done and be more decisive. I feel like we're not decisive enough with what mm. we're doing at the moment. We're dilly-dallying. And I just yeah. think we need to stop dilly-dallying and sort of get stuff done. Give their heads a wobble. That's what they need to do. I agree, uh, Dave, with uh, Mia. That's sort of my answer as well. I think you do start with the mm. outgoings. It's a bit of a traffic jam. I think we even spoke about it in the fan show. A lot of people seem mm. to probably agree with Mia that it sort of feels like in order for even any of the incomings to happen, you actually got to get rid of yeah. all of the dross that already is still in the squad. And it was kind of also part of the danger of bringing so many players with us in that sort of preseason tour where it was like, were they really going to get shipped off, you know, during that uh, Australia and kind of Asia tour? Likely not. Mm. So we found ourselves, you know, with only, I guess, a couple of weeks left before this Brentford game and so many players that still need to go. Yeah, look, Jack, it's it's absolutely hindering everything we're doing. Like you think about, we took what, 31, 32 out to Australia, left five behind, six behind with injuries. So that's a squad of nearly 40 players. You have to cut that down to 25. And within that 25, you can only have 17 foreign and the rest have to be sort of English and homegrown. So, you know, we really do. We have got a massive work to do to refine that squad. And 
look, we can't keep running into this situation every single window because all it's doing is just getting bigger and bigger as the summers go by where we don't really have players that clubs really see the value in and we just keep letting them skate by. And this is what I was saying the other day, Jack, you know. I know people had the gripes with Paratici, but at least he loaned them out to free up space in the squad to be able to bring players in. We're now sitting here two weeks, uh, less than two weeks, 11 days out from the season opener. And we're still sitting here with no one knows what the starting 11 uh, is, is more or less going to be. No one has a clue what players are staying, what players are out the door on the ranch post Coglu. No one knows what's coming in and how quickly we're going to do it. So we're in quite a pickle. We're in quite a mess. And at some point, yeah. I agree with Mia, we have to start sort of terminating contracts. And look, the way that sort of process goes, because I was listening to... Um, Remember Ricky Lambert, the guy from Southampton and Liverpool, he was talking about something the other day where he had one year left on his contract at Cardiff uh, before he was due to retire. And basically, you know, um, he wanted a certain percentage of that played up, but the club were only going to pay him a certain percentage. And he just held out, held out, held out till he got what he wanted. So basically, you know, if, if you're Sanchez or players in the prime right now at that sort of age, you're going to want 100% of it paid up. And I don't think the club want to pay it up. So I think this is going to go on to more or less very, very late in the window with all these squad players here because they're going to hold out for a certain amount and the club are going to try and just offer them, lowball them just to see if they'll accept it or rush them into accepting it or hoping that they'll delay it, delay it, delay it, that clubs will need you or can come in and get them as a last resort or something like that. But, this whole situation is hindering us. It's hindered many managers because we end up holding on to players, a part of the squad that just aren't good enough to be here and continue to cost us. So at some stage, we have to move on from this and why not make it this summer? And for me, what's left to do, Jack, is get them out, yeah. go and get a few de a few defenders in here, maybe another midfielder, and I think we're set to go. Yeah, it just feels like uh, maybe a year ago we were talking about Paratici cooking, but then how much cleaning he had to do. We kind of said that he needs to yeah, almost did. clean the kitchen before he even needs to, you know, kind of engage with the cooking. And if kind of find ourselves right, where still it's, you know, so many players that you still have to get rid of, that you have to clean out of the squad. If you were to start somewhere, Mia, and if you were to maybe, let's say, get rid of certain players straight away or just certain contracts that maybe you even feel like just should be ripped up and kind of just get the ball rolling where would you start with the outgoings um i would start with sanchez i feel like that we've had other times where people have looked like they're interested so if we really don't want to do it and we just want to get some money for him we need to just allow him to go either really cheap or try and agree something with him so he can go because i feel like we need to start there um i feel that if we're going to get another um, sent back in, then we should get rid of a Roden as well. We need to sort out Roden yeah. um, as well. He's another one. Um, I don't think I'm going to get it all done, so I'm going to be realistic. And I know nobody wants to hear about Eric Dyer and Ben Davies, but because of their, because of the way things are, I just don't think they're going to go. And I know people don't like it, but if I'm trying to be as realistically honest about things. Um, so I feel like they're going to stay. Yeah. Maybe get a Tanganga loan. If we can't sell him, let him go on loan, you know, just like no, do yeah. something. There are options to loan. So a few of these players need to maybe go out on loan. The one that we can loan, maybe just sort out a loan for them. Just so we're there off the, like out of the squad for the well, time being. If we do that though, me, will we not get the same, will, will the club not get the same reaction they got to it last summer where it was like, oh, well, they haven't sold them. They're just pushing the pro problem further down the line. I, you know, they're only loaning them out. Yeah, no, I get that. But yeah. what I'm trying to say, if we sell more this time and loan just a few, because yeah. then few might make the difference in the numbers in the squad, yeah. is what I'm saying. So the ones that maybe we can't sell won't be able to do anything with their contracts, just you know, loan a few of them out, because I think yeah. that would at least free up some of the wages, yeah. some of the, like, obviously the spots as well. Um, yeah. And yeah. I would say... Again, this isn't going to be popular for you two, but um, it looks like that Hoybier does want to go. It does look like he does want a new challenge, and I think Ange is happy to let him go. So someone like a Hoybier can go. Um, it looks like even Lacelso or Endon Bele. I'm not sure now because it looks like both of them have got people who are interested, especially Lacelso. So we might find that we might not sell Endon Bele, but have Lacelso go out the door. 
think we were given some type of answer from Pasacago in a press conference that Lacelso was here to stay. Basically, he kind of like said, "You don't have to go to Spain to find out where he's where he's going." You know, he's staying here, mate. I think is what he said to Ali Gold, and it looks mm-hmm. like Tongi might have lost out actually. And mm-hmm. we kind of okay. we, we sort of had like a mini question later, but maybe we can just kind of do just, maybe a tangent. But yeah, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, just just before you segue into that, look, there's obvious areas in the squad where we're, all, we're overstat. You look at goalkeeper, Picario, Fraser, Forrester, Larice, Brandon, Austin, and Whiteman. Two or three Somebody's of them can go at least. You look in the into midfield. I thought we think we brought what nine, ten midfielders on preseason tour with us that can all play in the sixes and the eights. So you've got to trim that down by you know to at least six, two for each uh, position. So you've got maybe three or four there that can go. You've also got. Four, le- uh, four left backs at the minute Adoji, Davies, Regulon, and Sessignon. So you yeah. can also clear out there. And then, like me alluded to, at centre backs as well, overstocked. So there's, you know, forward areas, I'm okay with. I think we need to keep all of our players up there. Look, Perisic, I'm a bit undecided on. I don't really want to carry wages of 170 gram at him being on the bench, but, you know, that hasn't He's been any movement assist, on him. Impacts. But the main areas is we need to chop down the midfield, we need to chop down the centre-back, the goalkeepers and the left-back situation. And that would improve our situation massively in terms of squad numbers, which then means we can start addressing other areas of the squad. But I'll be honest with you, I get, I, I can understand why we're in the situation we're in. But I don't agree with that. I think the club should just go out and full full force press forward with the plans, buy the players, get them in the door. And if other players don't want to leave, let them rot there. I know that we've got a wage structure and I know it's not ideal business and it's not really practical business for us to do. But at some stage, we have to look after ourselves and stop looking after them guys and just mm. get the players in and move forward. I agree with what both of you said about being maybe more ruthless when it comes to the center backs, because if you get a lot of the center backs out the door, it just puts further pressure to bring in some center backs. And Mm -hmm. I think even Ange is kind of pointing to his own desperation with the center back situation. The fact that even he's played now Ben Davies, right? He was going to play him in the Leicester game at sort of starting him at the left sided center Mm -hmm. back. And then also in this most recent game against the Sailors, he started him at left sided center back. I feel like Dyer is going to stay and we did have to sort of eat our vegetables, Dave, and make that prediction, you know, and say that he probably will stay. But it is a bit strange that even Ann just sort of like willing to put Davies ahead of Dyer, Roden, Sanchez, maybe even Tanganga, I guess now at this stage uh, at that left sided center back position. And when he was even asked about it, he said he still sees Davies as more of a left back than he even does a center back. So it could be the case that he is actually desperate for what you guys just said you want to happen to happen, which is actually just kind of starting to fire sale some of these uh these center backs, you know, get rid of Sanchez, give it to, you know, give him to Real Batiste, make the, you know, bid quite low. So maybe he can, uh you know, get his wages that he needs. And, you know, same thing with maybe other players like Rodan and uh, Tanganga, perhaps as well, if need be, who knows. But it just feels like there needs to be a fire sale kind of there in the center back department because the fact that he's persisted with Davies is kind of interesting to me. Uh, look, for me, he's persisting with him because he has to. We haven't given him any other choice, you know. We just haven't. That's the simple, harsh reality of it. And we're going into another season now where, look, the club still have time. I must stress that. But for me, it's sort of like we, we, we've we just hampered ourselves really for the first four mm-hmm. or five games of the season. But look... Let's wait and see what happens, but they better get a move on because, I mean, even the most patient of fans are becoming pissed mm-hmm. off. Would you see any incomings, you know, still? Do you see a Tapsoba, a Van de Van, um, an Adarabayo, I don't know, some type of maybe starting center back? And who's to even say whether, you know, any of those guys are the real, you know, center back that we actually need? But do you see a real incoming happening between now and the Brentford, uh, Mia, as well as some of these outgoings happening? Yeah, I do think we will get someone. Um, we've seen the not, uh, um, update from um, Fabrizio Romano about we're still deciding. I was like, it's like a non-update update because it's no new information to me. I'm a bit like, why are we still deciding? Like, this isn't deciding like what like your life choices. It's more like choosing what chocolate bar you want. You know, <laughs> like it's not really like the big. Like, I can't understand why we're taking so long to decide on a centre back. And what one do you want? What one suits you better? Oh, this one, mate. Excellent. Like, that's it. Cool. Like, I don't understand why we're faffing about it. 
I think it's like we have a broken leg and, you know, we're, you know, picking the color of the cast or something, you know, before we've even put the cast on, you know, for like months, we're just sitting there with a broken leg and, you know, we're, you know, deciding, you know, where we want to have the operation, where we want to be picked up from all these other things. And yeah, I completely agree. Sorry. It's just so frustrating. It's so frustrating to hear we're still choosing. I'm like, what kind of update is that to start with? Like I say, it's a non-update update. And like, why are we still choosing? Why was taking, what is the like reason we're taking so ridiculously long? I just don't understand. I can't understand the logic behind it. It's really not that, it should not be that difficult to decide. But yeah. I have heard mm. that apparently they are, they are getting a replacement for Van der Ben. So mm. could that lead to him being sold? But not necessarily to us, just saying. Um, That's true. It don't mean he's sold to us. Could be but Liverpool. No, it could be someone else. Could be yeah. someone else. But um, it looks like that could possibly be something. But, yeah, it's just really, really frustrating and confusing to what is taking us so long to decide. Mm. Mm. Ashley it's, Phillips, though, coming through the door, I guess. You know, we negotiated it down to yeah. two million. No, well, yeah. it's it's not. It's the release clause on Friday. Oh, right, yeah. So mm -hmm. what's happened is they were, I think they were a bit silly with what they done, actually, because yeah. what they did, they agreed it, we got the medical, and then they said, mm, actually, we want a bit more. So if we get the release clause on Friday and release him for two million, they could have lift, missed out on a million pounds, which they desperately need, because they didn't accept three million. It's silly. I don't know why they would do that. It's very easy to cut your nose off to spite your face kind of thing, in my opinion. Yeah. They tried to spark a bidding war and it backfired on them. But look, you know, the reason why they, did these deals take so long for Tottenham is because we piss about with stupid clauses. We know there's a fee. Okay, say one of them's 35 million, for instance. We'll come in at 20 million and we'll give you 2.5 million here, 2.75 million if he reaches another 10 international games, you know, another 5 million if his mother reaches her 50th birthday party and he's still at the club. It's an absolute joke and I'm bored of it. That's why these deals take so long. And because they're so protracting and all these stupid, silly clauses, you know, I've had two oranges today, there's a million. You know, I'm absolutely sick of it. The reason why it takes so long and then the reason why we're always in a position where we have to wait for other clubs to bring in their targets for us to get ours is because we just don't offer the right amount of money. If we just come in and say, look, we need them now. We're going to pay you 5 million above. There's 40 million. Thank you, wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. It's easy sometimes. We just make life harder on ourselves unnecessarily. I get negotiations. Don't get me wrong. I understand it. And, and you know, I like getting a steal. I like getting a bargain. But in times of must, you've got to adapt. You have to adapt that sort of business model or that approach and go and get what you need in order to give your, your team, your manager, your players and everything else the best chance of success on the pitch. So at times you will have to adapt that and we don't do it. And that's why we're sitting here waiting for Wolfsburg to get in a player when we could just walk in and say, give me him now. Thank you. I'm all out with him. I think we have more tolerance for like the deal negotiations and you know all that sort of jazz when it came to maybe the david rea kind of one because we all kind of felt like yeah like that's probably too expensive for somebody like that it's understandable spurs are kind of low-balling maybe looking at someone else at the same time but when it comes to the center back situation i completely agree it is absolutely strange that we have kind of gone about it with the same sort of maybe negotiation tactics that we always do that are kind of typical cliche spurs when we've been in desperate need for these players. And it's a bit strange, probably even if you were the Wolfsburg or Leverkusen parties where you're kind of like, why aren't they coming in with these big bits, you know, for these guys when they are desperate, you know, for these players, they probably them are a bit confused. So I don't know. It's the most frustrating thing to see that spurs when the one position that's so obvious that they need in, aren't changing their act by at least the looks of things and are continuing to kind of operate in a similar manner. What do you think, Mia? Yeah, the only thing I would say, playing a bit of devil's advocate, let's just let's just imagine. Do you think that possibly it's Wolfsburg who are messing us a little bit around because they want to increase the price and they also have said to us, wait, wait, wait until we get a replacement because we don't want to be left in the lurch? Could that be? And something? if there's other bidders, I'm not, it, I'm not trying to say that is the case. I'm just saying um, as an example. No, why? I'm, I think Dave know. wants the Todd mm. Bowley approach, where Dave wants a bit more of that kind of like just throw the money at them and you know take it or leave it. You know, like an offer they can't refuse, which you saw Bully kind of do with a lot of teams and it backfired on him. Right. Where now he's selling a lot of those players that he ended up kind of throwing a lot of money at. But I think that's what 
maybe we just want a bit more of maybe is Levy yeah. being a bit more on the other side of kind of the spectrum when it comes to, you know, kind of deal negotiations. We want to see him walk up to the table, just throw a big wad of cash down and then just walk out, you know, with mm. the player and everything kind of style, which is, mm. you know, a bit unrealistic, but we've never seen him really do it before. And that's what we're looking for. Like, like that's the thing. I get it, right? Yeah, Wolfsburg are probably saying to Tottenham, you know, can you wait till we get one of our players in, you know? And the reason why Tottenham say yes is because they've negotiated probably 20 million up front with all these different clauses, so they have to wait. Whereas if they just come in and acted like big boys and said, look, we ain't waiting around, take it or leave it. Simple. But we don't do that. I can understand, right, if we've got a full 11 and we negotiate, you can sit there, you can take your time all summer long and negotiate all you want. No problem at all. I'll sit there, I'll be patient, you know, because it's not like you 100% need them, right? You've already got your 11 out there. You can sort of take your time to negotiate. But when we're in need, after the season we've had with three managers in the dugout, after the last four years we've had where we haven't had a manager in the dugout for a full season because of the centre-back issue, and it has not been addressed for three to four years, even though every manager in the door since has asked for centre-back. Josie asked for centre-back. They brought him Joe Roden. Nuno asked for centre-back. They brought him Romero. Okay, fair enough. And then Conte asked for a centre-back, and all they done was bring him in Clement Langley on loan. And Ange Postacoglu, after the AC Milan, has asked for a centre-back, and he hasn't got one. So it's their pro, it's their inability and, and their not willingness to be proactive that has caused this whole situation in general. And when it's come back to cost us as dearly as it did last season with no European football, etc., etc., and all the knock-on effects it's had, now's the time where you go and act the big boys and you go and address it with serious proactiveness. And that shows then the fans that you actually care. Rather than sitting there just holding back, waiting out, you know, trying to, you know, play, call each other's bluffs and play up until two weeks out from the season. Okay, from the club's point of view, business point of view, okay, it makes sense. But from a manager's point of view and a squad's point of view, and in terms of gelling, clicking on the training pitch, forming a cohesive team, it's not ideal. Mm. No, I think a lot of the players must be desperate uh, to see some new faces come in in that, in that area. Um mm. I think, you know, some people probably are anticipating some sort of Harry Kane conversation since we do have Mia and Dave here on the same panel. <laughs> and there is some news that we can now work with. We don't, you know, have to, you know, use the same old news with Harry Kane. We've been given kind of some new meat to chew on here. And I guess it has been in some way cleared up. Mia, what do you think? Like, is he given some type of clarity to you on the situation? I feel like even if he hasn't given you any clarity, he's in some way given Bayern I think a deadline or given Bayern some type of clarity. What do you think? Um, yeah, I think he's. I think that the fact that it has to come from someone else and he hasn't come out and directly said it speaks volumes. I feel like that Romero's come out, or Sonny has come out and clarified stuff quite clearly about intentions, etc. Where Harry Kane has to have somebody else to do it for him. I feel like he kind of always wants to play like the nice guy, so he also added in there a little oh, I might sign. And the example I used on Jacob's show was, um, shout out to uh, Jacob on United um, Spurs of America. I went on there with him last night. So, yeah, the example I used is, know when you're in like a casual relationship as they lead you on and you're like, are we going to get serious? Are we not? And they go, oh, I'm not sure yet, babe. But they carry on whining, dining you, doing all the good things. And then they're just, you're still like, are we are we in a relationship? And they're like, no, nah, no, nah, let's not put a label on it. Let's not put a label. I feel like Harry Kane's doing a bit of that. I feel like he's leading us down a little path and he's like, oh, I might sign, I might not, I might, you know, I'm going to stay. If they, if they don't obviously offer the right money, of course he's going to stay. That's like Captain Obvious, that is. When they wrote that, I was like, well, duh, if they don't offer the money, of course they're going to, of course he's going to stay because they're not going to give the right money um, for like the offer. So, of course, if you don't get that offer, he's going to stay. But the mm. fact that they put in that other little caveats and stuff was a bit like, a bit kind of like trying to play the nice guy and kind of like leading oh, us. The along. sprinkles that Dave's lo that Dave loves yeah, though. It's exactly what he needed like, to hear. Exactly, but that's what I'm saying. See, I read between the lines a little bit more. Hence the uh, the name. So you, um, would you say that Dan Kilpatrick is, you know, I did ask that question to Dave. He's known as being a bit more positive leaning when it comes to Spurs. Do you think he was giving it more of a positive bend, the Harry Kane situation? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I feel, yeah, I feel like it's a bit of a, a bit of a PR, a little bit of PR there, you know, <laughs> sprinkled. Let's get a bit of Harry Kane back on side with the fans because, you know, he's been in their bad books a little bit. And I feel like, yeah, I'm not too sure about the whole thing. 
And so I'm a bit like, yeah, mm. it's great. He might stay, he might not. It's nothing new. We haven't actually learned anything new from that conversation that he apparently had with Harry Kane. But you know what, though, Mia, right? You say there that you don't like, you know, or Harry Kane didn't, you know, have the courage to come out and say anything. But when people were talking about Charlie Kane, everyone was like, well, Harry Kane must have said something to them, this, that, and the other. So we can't sort of pick and choose, you know, when the words suit us and when they don't. You know, people said that when Charlie Kane supposedly was over there meeting with representatives, that that came from Kane. So I presume that Dan Kilpatrick article has either come from Charlie Kane and representatives or some way via Harry Kane. Look, whether we like it or not, if I was Harry Kane, I'm the best striker in world football, bar Munich, they want me. Well, they haven't stumped up the bid. And if I'm Harry Kane, I'll be completely embarrassed because what Bayern Munich have done is they've low-balled Tottenham and then they've manipulated and used the press with his wife apparently being over there looking at places. They've held <clears> meetings, <throat> the Bayern guy turning up with their Kane Bayern Munich jersey. And they've used the press to try and force Kane to force the issue with Tottenham Hotspur. Harry Kane has not done that. He has not forced the issue, despite what all the papers and the ITKs have been telling people all summer long. He's going to United. He's going to Madrid. He's going to Bayern Munich. PSG are looking at him. This, that, and the other. But Harry Kane is still here, but yet everyone questions the guy's loyalty. You know, at the end of the day, he has not forced that issue. And in fact, he's come out and he's doubled down. He said, I do not want to disrupt Tottenham season. I don't want to disrupt uh, Ange Postacoglu's season. And I will stay if I'm still here at the Brentford game. And basically what he's done is he's come out and he set the deadline. And for me, I don't think Bayern Munich want to pay the 100, 105 million. I believe their record transfer fee is that Hernandez guy at 80 million. I'm not sure they want to go anywhere uh, sort, of, sort of above that. And Daniel Levy ain't going to drop down. It was the ball was always in Daniel Levy's court, meet my price, or we don't go anywhere. And I believe Harry Kane has been embarrassed by the whole pursuit, the fact that his pregnant wife was brought into the whole pursuit and everything else to sort of try and force this guy to force the issue. Absolutely. If I was Harry Kane, I'd be more than likely wanting to stay at Tottenham. And I've said this all along. The argument shouldn't have always been. And if we were being balanced on the situation, it wouldn't have just been sell Kane, sell Kane, sell Kane. We would have counteract discussions that no one was having until I brought it up that what can we do to keep Harry Kane here? So if we we're going to be balanced on the situation, that would have been a part of the discussions, which it never was. And it looks like you know, that Harry Kane, you can also take it, that he's put pressure on the club to go and sign the centre-backs so that he can sign on the dotted line. I guarantee there's no guarantee of him signing on the dotted line if he does stay. But Ali Gold and Anka Patrick have said it over the last couple of weeks, both uh, reputable Spurs journalists, that this isn't just a one-way conclusion, that this guy's leaving the club, and it never has been. So for me, I still hold out hope, 11 days and counting. Is he turning his shoulder more to just... Byron, Dave, is he kind of maybe turning on Byron a bit more, do you think, um, before I go to Mia? From what from what my understanding is, is that uh, he's a little frustrated. Yeah, the, camp, the campaign too happy with the unprofessionalism of the Bayern Munich pursuit. Hmm. Sorry, Mia. Go ahead. Sorry. What I would say is that with Harry Kane, I understand that everyone's saying about the, like, the way that the German press go about it. But if you go and look, actually, that is just the way their press is. So maybe we don't we don't quite understand it. But apparently, that is what their press is like towards footballers, etc. Like, this is how they regularly behave. And it obviously is a very different cultural thing to over here. And maybe that's why we're so um, shocked by this kind of behaviour, because we're not used to this kind of behaviour happening mm. Um, yeah. when it comes to yeah. our press. So um, I'm not yeah. trying to justify it. I'm just saying, mm. like, it is maybe um, a very different way of their approaching it. Mm. Um, and the fact is, if Harry Kane wasn't for sale, there would be no conversations. There wouldn't be any conversations, no flights over to the UK from the German people, like, um, like their, whatever they fought over, the, um, mm. the two people that flew, out, flew over. They wouldn't have done that if Harry Kane was zero not for sale, absolutely no conversation. Mm. So that gives me indications that there, he is for sale. He's agreed personal terms, and it has been stated by Fabrizio Romano, I think, has said it. Some very reputable people, I think, or Ornstein, someone has said he has signed these terms. So therefore, he is not happy to leave. So to try and say that maybe perhaps that it isn't all, it is all just one way, and Harry Kane is completely maybe innocent in this situation. I don't believe it. I don't believe it for a second. I believe I that. I would, 
Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mayo. You, sorry, you were. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that he is. He has spoken to Bayern Munich, or Charlie has represented him. He's his brother. He's not going to go la 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 la. I'm not listening to anything you say, Charlie. I'm sure that he has discussions with him and speaks mm. to him regarding this. Like, I'm sure that he 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 does. So I'm pretty I'm pretty certain that conversations had been had because Bayern Munich seemed pretty confident in the fact they've spoken to him in a way that he wants to come to Bayern Munich. So. Yeah, they do have to stump up the money, but we also have to understand if he doesn't, we have to be reasonable with our expectations of the money. We can't just expect that money because if he doesn't want to sign and we lose him on a free and he goes to a rival, then people who want his pain to stay, what are they going to say? Oh, he's now gone to Chelsea. Everyone's going to be devastated by that. So you can't... But no one's ever said he doesn't want to sign up. But what I'm saying, if he doesn't sign, my point would be if he does not sign and he goes to a Chelsea and then people said... Oh, but we we're waiting to see if he would sign if he wouldn't. To me, that's a bigger risk than to let him go now and get the money for him because the risk is he might not sign. What's his expectations? Because at the end of the day, there's no expectations set. He just said if he sees improvement, what's improvement to Harry Kane then? He didn't give an expectation because he doesn't want, I don't think he wants to sign because there's no expectation in my mind that somebody who like Harry Kane, who wants to win trophies, who said he wants to win trophies, we know he wants to win trophies, wants. Mm. So to me, we're not going to win. I don't think this year we're going to win a trophy. I'm going to be honest and I'm going to be realistic. I feel like we're fighting the Cups, perhaps, but we're not going to be fighting for big trophies. So for me, I just think at the end of the day, we know that he wants to get those. So what's the chance of us getting those? Pretty low. So for me, I feel like, he won't sign and then he's going to go on a free and go to whoever and then everyone's going to mm. be upset about it. So it sounds mm. like Mia, Dave, and I kind of want to say something after, but it sounds like Mia, Dave, is just mm. not that convinced that Harry Kane is really that keen on really ever mm. signing. He sort of kind of just doesn't want to say it, you know, is sort of leading us on. Mm. It kind of sounds like if I were to take us, you know, take her words from the beginning, you know, mm. kind of leading us on a little bit here, whereas you're kind of, if I imagine in the camp that, Harry Kane's still making his mind up and he's happy to sign if he gets mm -hmm. that, you know, love and that sort of um, not love, but more that feeling that, you know, that in his head and in his heart that, you know, Spurs are back in the right directions again um, because yeah, he but, is a Tottenham fan at the end of the day. But that comes off quotes that have actually directly come from Harry Kane's mouth, not true sources, not true newspaper agencies, this, that and the other. It's true interviews that Kane has given that he's always had the ambition of wanting to win trophies at Tottenham Hotspur. And it's always been since since he um, signed the improved wages since that Man City ordeal that it was always up to Tottenham to try and put us back in that position, and we failed. But, you know, this whole thing that he won't sign, no one can say that. There's been no report saying he will not sign. It's 50-50. You know, there's been more reports saying that he there's a chance he will negotiate or try and negotiate with the football club in terms of signing if he is here beyond beyond the trans window, which now, if he's here beyond the Brentford game. So, you know, it's all if, buts and maybes if he doesn't sign. Going to a rival again, before the rivals can even sniff round them, Bayern Munich, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Juve, all them teams can start negotiating with him in January, where Chelsea, United, people like that, they can't go near him up until the summer. So there's more chance of him being tempted by Real Madrid and, and going off there if it does happen. But look, I've stayed all along. My belief is that Tottenham are going to try and do their best to keep him and mm. that, um, you know, they're going to try and uh, try, try and get him to negotiate a new contract. And I think they'll have a certain feeling within them that, that maybe perhaps... He, you know that he might he might want to sign on the dotted line. I feel like that's wishful yeah. thinking, Dave, because we've offered him a massive wage. Apparently, he's got a contract in front of him for massive wages that he can sign. He can sign that, but he said this summer he ain't signing. So that leaves it until when? When's he going to decide and leave us stringing on and then get to January? And he can talk to those other clubs so we've only got a short amount of time where he should or he can or he can't mm. sign before other clubs can still come in for him again in january it's, we can't mm. allow that to happen it's sentimentality like it's we not, want this done be not, because we it's, we, not we, not we, it's it what i believe is best for the football club right so do you agree with what okay do you agree with what psg have said to Kylian mbappe listen either you sign this contract 
or you're gone because we can't allow you to go next year to Real Madrid, who we already feel like you've probably got some sort of agreement with, which is tapping up, by the way. I don't think they're supposed to be allowed to do that. Um, but they're going to basically, they've said to him, no, 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 we're not having that. We're not going to allow you to do that to us because at the end of the day, we're a big club. You want to go? Cool. Because you're not going to sign a contract. And I feel like, yeah, that's how you should. That's not having sentimentality towards a player. That's saying, listen, man, you sign the contract or you go. We're not going to allow you to sign The, the difference with that, though, me, is that PSG would get rid of Mbappe and go and get the next, next best player in the world. They have a history of doing that. They've got world class players throughout the team. We don't. There's a difference between PSG letting Mbappe go and Harry Kane. Uh, Tottenham letting Harry Kane go, a massive golf indifference. PSG just stopped by world class players and they'll just let him go and bring in the next guy. Tottenham won't do that. But it's not about the thing is the way that Ange works, he likes to have a team. He doesn't necessarily like to have this mega, mega star. He likes to have a team of, of players who work together, who score goals uh, like throughout the team. So for me, I feel like having that superstar isn't really an edge thing to do anyway so for me well, i we don't actually that, don't I, we? we can't I think say that's, that he uh, managed that celtic japan and australia he's never going to have that megastar he hasn't yeah. had the opportunity to work but with a megastar i was going to i was going to say Sorry, something after me i was going to say something after you guys but Mia, i was going to just quickly say that maybe he hasn't ever had the opportunity to really have a real megastar so it's hard to know whether he he might feel that way he could feel that way but he hasn't exactly had even the chance to have a real megastar and the only opportunity would be at Celtic. But even the time when he joined Celtic, there weren't exactly any, you know, you know, kind of players that were there that were maybe more world renowned at the time. It was maybe a bit more of a, I would say younger kind of Celtic squad that was kind of there mm. when he was. But in terms of the players he brought in, look at the calibre and the type of players he likes to bring in. He likes to bring young players in. And we've been known the best times that we've done is when we have actually brought in younger players through. We have brought younger players when we bought Modric, when we bought Val, even Toby and Jan, they weren't very old when we bought them. They were kind of a bit more um, to the unknown. Deli Ali was a bit more of the unknown. We actually do well when we have those kind of players, if you think about yeah. it a little bit more. So Ange works more in that kind of way. You can tell he's not going to demand like what Conte or Jose did, these big players. Mm. And so I don't think having... No, Harry Kane is going to hinder in the way that he wants to play the football that he wants to play. I just mm. don't think it does. On the kind just, of mm. yeah, yeah. Sorry, Dave. Go ahead. And then no, I'm I was just going to say no. Go on, Jacko. Sorry, go on. Well, mine's like a bit more off topic, but I was going to say like on the sort of Harry Kane kind of leading us on, you know, kind of stealing, you know, as I always do, Mia's analogies. <laughs> um, Harry Kane <clears throat> leading us on. I do feel like he could be leading Bayern on though as well. Like it, it does seem to be the case that he hasn't jumped for joy yet. You know, at Bayern, he hasn't exactly forced a move, you know, to Spurs in any way. He's sort of kind of led on both parties. And I do think that's because Harry Kane is a bit delusional like myself and that he's a Spurs fan, I think, at the end of the day. And that's why he's actually stuck around as long as he has. If he didn't really have the love or connection with Spurs, I imagine he actually would have forced moves even harder beforehand or he would be forcing this move even harder than you might think he is now. And the fact that he is sort of doing this kind of dilly-dallying kind of approach and this kind of like, oh, I'm not so sure yet. Maybe I might actually you know, get behind, you know, a, a bit of a, a new lead with Spurs or if Spurs have a chance, you know, of improvement of, you know, maybe showing some uh, sign of direction, I'll do it. And I think that's just because he's a Spurs fan at the end of the day. And he will say kind of delusional things that might not make a lot of sense to the average person who would be thinking just solely about his career. He's a guy who hasn't exactly, I think, thought solely about his career. He's kind of actually stuck with Spurs through some pretty bad flips and times just because he loves this club and he loves being in London and he loves, I think, being here. And he's had his maybe mo moments where he's obviously been very tempted because of how good he is and how many people want him. And this is now a time period where Spurs are yet again going through those big dips like we usually do. And his loyalty is going to be kind of put into question. But the fact that he hasn't given any sort of real firm answer to anybody i actually think is more due to the fact that he's kind of a spurs fan and that he doesn't really know what he wants there's that part in his heart where he just wants to stay at tottenham and win something with tottenham and just be here forever and then there's that part that kind of goes like everybody's telling you that you should go on and win the champions league that you should go on and play with the best players in the world so i actually do think it's as simple as this he's getting caught between 
two minds between what his brain is telling him to do, which might be going to Bayern, and then also what his heart is telling him to do, which is just stay at Spurs and, you know, just don't think about it. Sort of no, thing. Joe, what he's doing, he's basically cheating. What he's doing is cheating on his girlfriend, telling his girlfriend all the sweet nothings, all the nice things, everything, being all like lovey-dovey, then going off his, to his, his uh, spit on the side, doing the exact same thing, being all lovey-dovey, and he doesn't want to tell either of them the truth. And when the, the side thing says to him, listen, you need to make a decision, he's like... Oh, but I don't want to make that decision because basically he doesn't want to, he wants to play them both off of each other. Because he doesn't want to be the bad guy. Yeah, because he doesn't want to be the bad guy because it's much easier to play both of them off against each other than actually make a full blown decision and look like a bad guy in somebody's eyes. I don't blame him for not wanting to look like the bad guy, though. I think I would do kind of a bit of the same thing. And if he goes to Bayern, I think that's the least, that's probably the least consequential or, you know, what would you say, controversial sort of club that he would go to, I think, for, for us Spurs mm. fans too. But sorry. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, no, and I know, uh, and I know, Dave, uh, you were going to say something earlier and then no, maybe we could yeah. move on to another question as well. Yeah. Look, I'll, uh, I'll say this quickly. Look, for me, Jack, I just think I've never been convinced that he's going to leave. For me, it's been blown up by ITKs and, and, and papers. You know, when you look at Harry Kane's reaction towards the end of the season, okay, look, sort of pissed off at the end of the season, just like everybody else. But that emotion, that tears in his eyes, which you won't be able to hold back when you love a club, that wasn't there like it was the last time um, when the whole Man City debacle was coming around. So for me, I've never been fully convinced by it. And, you know, the stories has changed so many times about him agreeing with this club, agreeing with that club, talking to this club, talking to that club. We're 11 days out from the Brentford game and he's still a Tottenham player. You know, if, if Ange Postacoglu was sick of the situation or didn't want him around, he would have told the club to sort that one out straight away and be able to get the other players in for him to work with. So for me, and I've always maintained this, I think many people agree with me on this, Andrew's job is easier with Kane than without Harry Kane. And um, so for me, you know, I'm 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 not convinced. I think it's like I've said all along, I think it's been blown up by one side, one side only. The stuff they put out in the paper suits their narrative. If you're Harry Kane, you're never gonna come out and say anything ever. You know, you put yourself in a weaker position in terms of negotiation if you do want to sign a new contract or even if he does want to move, you know, you put yourself in a weaker position with Bayern Munich. But at the end of the day, I've never can, never been convinced that he was ever going this summer, to be honest with you. So in well, worse words, in worse words, you think the fact that when he was cheating on us with Man City, he was crying and he was, you know, showing a lot of emotion that time. Whereas this time he was a bit more stone cold, which means he isn't cheating on us. If you go back and look at it, the last game uh, I think of, I think it was uh, under Money Mason. He's walking around, walking around, and he's all applauding. There was tears in his eyes, everything else. At the end of this season, that wasn't there. What he did speak about was getting back to values and morals and everything else that we had under Pochettino. True. I'll make a few points. When you cheated more than <laughs> once, it doesn't affect you as much. Because the second time round, you're like, yeah, I've done this before. I don't need to be emotional about it no more. Yeah, <laughs> I've got, yeah, you know, I've been there, done that, got the trophy, uh, got the trophy. If you get oh, what I mean. Um, but yeah, um, on the other on the other side of things, to be honest with you, he signed personal agree- he signed personal terms with Bayern Munich. That doesn't smack to somebody who is adamant that they don't want to leave. Why would you sign yeah, personal? It's been said by like a lot of high, like if you look at the tears of people that are saying it, David, is it just? They've the, also said that he was going to Man United, Real Madrid, PSG. No, no, none of the high, none of the people that are top tier have said Romano anything linked like PSG. Pardon? Romano linked them with PSG. Linked Romano him. He didn't say he was United. going. Yeah, but linking with someone and saying they have agreed personal terms is a very, very different scenario because you can you can be linked. We've been linked with met with um, Mbappe. That means nothing. Does that mean anything? Because we've been linked with him. No. Have we agreed personal terms with him? No. There's somebody in the comments. Let us know who the ITK was. That all uh, I'm saying did is the, did that. But yeah, I think then we can move on. Yeah. yeah. All I'm saying on that just quickly is. Stuff is put out there. There's no proof that he signed on a dotted line with Bayern Munich. And, you know, them same people also said he was leaving for the clubs, and it has not happened. So, he didn't say you know, that. we they can sit here linked. and choose what we want to believe. But in reality, but the words of matter. Been but the words matter, Dave. To say you've been linked, we were linked with Mbappe. That means nothing. To say personal terms have been agreed is a much bigger sign that somebody wants to do it because Bayern Munich wouldn't come over here and have meetings if he didn't agree. Because what's the point of them doing that? It would be a waste of their time negotiating with somebody who doesn't want to come. It doesn't make any logical sense. You don't agree to come and have a meeting 
If you're gonna if you're gonna buy a car, you, you do. If you're the one that's pursuing the player, you're the one that wants the but player. If you know, you're the one that's you know they don't want to come, come up and, if, and get a deal done. If I want to buy a car, but I know they're not selling, and I know they're adamant on not selling it, I'm not going to go to the people to sell to buy, try and buy a car that they don't want to sell me. It doesn't make mm. any sense. I think we could talk about someone who has, in some sense, committed his future uh, to Tottenham, and he has made it quite clear. And uh, some people did question his loyalty, they questioned his commitment. And uh, I'm curious where they are now. Where are they hiding? Because it does feel like Christian Romero at some stage last season had a lot of heat around him. I think it was probably mm. kind of before the World Cup. And it also felt post-World Cup, right? It felt like he was still kind of yeah. getting a bit of heat. And I don't really know how to put this to you, Dave and Mia, but maybe I'll just start with, uh, I don't know, like kind of both of you together. Like, do you just feel like Romero, kind of two-part question, is Romero kind of shutting up the haters a little bit and also at the same time did his reputation take a bit of a hit for something you know maybe that he did actually do last season do you think there's maybe something he could have done differently where did it kind of go wrong where did that sort of reputation mm -hmm. take a hit why did it take a hit? yeah sort of thing yeah i feel like for me i feel people underestimate the whole situation in the back room because we've already heard the charles have come out and speak about he was berated for two hours solid with uh, conte so i just don't think that all the i don't think the players were in the right frame of mind because if you're going to go into if you're going to go somewhere and you know that that you're on tender hooks you're walking on eggshells because they might shout at you because you've walk to the left a bit more than you should have been like more in the middle and that's the kind of person Conte like kind of strikes me as and if anybody's seen it go and watch the uh, thing with Kulu and Sonny and they had to do impersonations of things and the other person had to guess mm -hmm. um, and basically Sonny um, did, did, was pointing and, and like basically pointing and looking like they were angry and Kulu turned around and said oh pointing and shouting it must be Conte that tells you like all these all the players are coming out and having these little digs about Conte. So it just shows you maybe out how actually truly unhappy they were. And I feel like maybe that unhappiness came across like Romero didn't care. But I've always kind of stuck up for Romero and said, I don't think he doesn't care. I feel like he does care. And I don't think this Argentina thing is a thing. I think that people have got that in their minds um, about certain players. And mm. that they always seem to criticise certain players for that behaviour. Um, and I just don't think it's right. And, mm. like, you know, everyone... I feel you think people forget how committed even the players for England are. They're very committed players to their country. And that's yes. understandable. And I don't, disres I don't find that disrespectful because at the end of the day, that's their country they're playing for. And they're mm. very patriotic. And I don't feel there's anything wrong with that. People misunderstood and mistook... Um, with Romero, what he actually was kind of doing, and like I feel that's not right. And mm. uh, yeah, I've always kind of stuck up for him a little bit, and I'm glad that he came out and spoke out about it. And I'm glad that he even he held his hands up as well and said I wasn't good enough. He said I mm. should have done better. So it wasn't like he tried to dismiss the he was an excuse he had for done. Him. Yeah, yeah, no, he wasn't excusing himself at mm. all. He actually came out and said, listen, I could have done better. I want to do better, so I, and I want to show you I can do better, and I want to do it at Tottenham. I've had offers, and I said no. So that just shows you he's had offers from other clubs, but he's committed to Tottenham. And I feel like that's what you want from a player. You want that commitment, and you want mm. them to come out and say those things. So to me, he said all the right things. He, he whispered those sweet nothings in my ears, and I was very happy about it. <laughs> And he said, in particular, right, I want to spend my best years here at Tottenham. Yeah. Right, Dave? I mean, and, and that's a great thing mm. for, for us to hear, that he wants to spend his prime years with Spurs. And again, mm. like I said to me, as, as loyalty was questioned, where did that kind of come from? And has mm. he maybe answered the haters, do you think, Dave? Look, f first of all, it's great for him to come out and tell us these things that he wants to spend these next few years here. You know, his prime years, which shows to me, you know, he, he reckons he's going to have a good few uh, years under his belt over the next couple of seasons. So I'm all for that. But Jack, I think where the um, where the sort of debate came in is is around Argentina with the World Cup. He was out injured, but he was still selected and going to the World Cup, and it was the same at the end of the season. But if anyone watched that. Argentina documentary about the World Cup team on Amazon Prime, they would know that they even bring players over that are injured anyway, you know, just to being around the squad. That whole team has just been one big boys camp where even if you're injured, you're good. They even brought Sergio Aguero as part of the World Cup squad with them and, and had him suited out and everything else. That's how tight-knit that group has been. So every opportunity they get, and they've been told, 
whether you're injured or not, come over. We need to be able to create this bond, to be able to create the team that we need to be able to go on and win a World Cup and everything else. And so if you haven't watched that Argentina documentary, I can understand why people would ask them questions and where that would come from. But if you've watched that documentary, and yeah, you'll have to put on English subtitles, but I did. It's fantastic, by the way. Um, but, you know, you'd understand that even the injured players, you know, they, they've, they've been going because they yeah, want to keep everybody together. So for me, that's where it's come from. But... You know, he's come out, you know, he said that he's had offers to go this summer, big offers, and he's turned them down because he wants to be here. So, fair play to him. And then um, more of that. I think, look, last season was a blip in the radar. There were so many players carrying injuries last season. Sonny played through uh, a lot of injuries. Kulu came back early from his injury. Ben Decor suffered an injury. Basuma was out at periods. So many injuries throughout that squad last year. You know, is it down to the training, the fitness, um, you know, this, that, and the other being overworked? It could very well be. But, you know, Romero wasn't an isolated case, but seemed to have carried a lot of the burden for the injuries or the frustration for the injuries. And it's sort of been, you know, directed at him or he just doesn't want to play this, that, and the other. And it, I don't think that was ever the case, Jack. And for me, I think, you know, we're very quick to forget the defender that we, or the, the centre-back, but when he didn't have the injury sort of disturbed season when Conte first came in, that Rolls-Royce defender. And there was still elements of that there last year, but there was also shades of dire in him last year. But for me, I think he's going to get back to, to Romero. I just, I think questioning his loyalty maybe came from two parts. I think it came from, right, his absence, you know, in a few games before leading up to the World Cup. But I did believe he had the real injury, like at the time. And also as well, it did seem like, yeah, if you sort of did have a World Cup that was just coming up and you were, you know, kind of having an injury that you were kind of carrying yourself through. I mean, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like as big of a crime as people made it out to be for a guy that is going to be, you know, playing for his national team. And the Argentina national team, I think maybe part of the reason maybe there could have been such disdain is because it's probably a big rival to England, right, for the World Cup. Like it's a team that competes, you know, for the highest of trophies. And it's probably a team that people were kind of thinking like, oh, well, he's just saving himself because he knows he might go win a trophy with Argentina. And he ended up winning that trophy with Argentina. He ended up being that World Cup champion. So if at any stage he felt like towards that, you know, break before the World Cup, I don't really feel even 100%. I also have this massive tournament, which is huge for me in my own career, mm -hmm. huge for me, my own kind of personal love for my own country. I don't really blame him for him being slightly conflicted on the situation about whether he thought he maybe did need to get that sort of surgery or whatever it was that he sort of did to take himself out of the team and put himself in with Argentina. I just, I get maybe some people would still feel a bit of kind of, you know, harshness towards him, but I just don't think it's as big of a crime as it's made out to be. I think it's kind of actually in a way, if you were in his position, it's quite understandable. And when he has played for us, I think there's a distinction between him playing maybe badly, but it's not like I would question really his effort most of the time. He's been an True. absolute warrior for us. And when they did start to kind of felt like fans kind of question his overall effort on the pitch, I just sort of thought like, this is getting a bit far because I feel like he's one of the players that has always been kind of, in fact, one of the, the most effort type players. He's the guy that's willing to sprint 40 yards across the pitch yeah. just to go crunch somebody. And, and he has those moments of rashness. But if you're going to question his effort, I mean, I just watched him single-handedly in that AC Milan game get himself sent off. Just he sprinted 50 yards across yeah. the pitch because he was tired of watching Ben Davies just sit in no man's land, not making the tackle. So he just mm -hmm. lost his head, ran over, and did it himself. If that's a guy who doesn't have any sort of effort, then I don't really know what is, you know, a player that has effort. I think he is actually more of, I'll be honest, kind of those kind of Hoiberg type players who really do just kind of love crunching people and do kind of love sort of a lot of the physical aspects of the game. Mm -hmm. So I could never see Romero kind of leaving himself out of a challenge or kind of pulling himself out of, you know, any sort of moment. He's never come across as that type of guy. I would actually say that more so with players like Eric Dyer, with players like Ben Davies and whatnot, who maybe at times in certain games have kind of looked like, yeah, this is above them. Or maybe they come up against certain teams in the Europa Conference League, like we've seen in the past, where they kind of did act like they were above that type of situation and everything. So I don't know. It did seem like questioning his overall effort was also something I didn't quite understand because it felt like that's something that I would throw at plenty of other players before I would throw that actually at Romero maybe first. But I don't know, me or Dave, anybody? Yeah, Joe, I was going to say, 
I was going to say, imagine the pressure, obviously, as well, because of Messi with um, with the World Cup. I feel like yeah. that was probably an added pressure that he, they, I think the whole of the Argentinian team probably had on mm. their heads a little bit. And I don't think we should underestimate the pressure of that because the whole thing was, is if Messi wins the World Cup, he is GOAT, 100%, no doubt in anybody's mind, he is the GOAT. Mm. And I feel like that that pressure on them was probably very much so. And I feel like that maybe as well, he did feel like some sort of responsibility mm. and that kind of pressure to perform or to go over and be part of the the team and also i think he was when he was on the pitch i think he was actually injured still i think he still yeah, wasn't great that. at the beginning he wasn't all that good because i think he still was injured but as i say i feel like that yeah that's a silly thing to do people are going to say he shouldn't go on the pitch if he's injured but i think people underestimate that pressure the messy pressure because everybody wanted messi to win this world cup let's be honest everybody, everybody wanted to be a part of that team everybody wanted yeah to everybody wanted to be part of that so in my mind, I feel like that people maybe underestimate that pressure that Argentina Argentina would have put on to the players as well um, mm, regarding yeah. that World Cup. Completely yeah. agree. Another thing I was going to bring up too, though, Dave, was that maybe the fact that I felt like his mistakes too at certain stages last season were kind of being highlighted with more emphasis than some of the other schoolboy errors we were seeing from other defenders. Mm -hmm. Like I get it, kind of Romero did make some big mistakes last season. And maybe this is where it comes from, is that people like ourselves really rate Romero quite highly. So we could overlook some of the errors that he does make. And then it feels like, yeah, he gets maybe a pass. But it also then feels like some of the errors that were kind of being highlighted, it's like, well, we've seen, you know, Dyer and Davies and Sanchez make those schoolboy errors, you know, every single week and probably to a much greater sort of kind of extent and maybe to much more of our own detriment than actually Romero does. So I just... I don't know. It just felt like his mistakes too at one point last season were really getting highlighted to an extent. So I think he's winning his haters back, you know, or he's, you know, he's pushing back against them, but we'll see how he does this season to, mm. to push against it. But that's the last point I make is that mm. it felt like his mistakes were kind of getting lumped into the dire Sanchez yeah. sort of category. To me. Yeah. Look, I agree with that as well, Jacko. For me, I found myself at times last season when you highlight where Davies went wrong or what Dyer's done wrong or Sanchez done wrong. There's more people out there to defend them and say you're being harsh. But when Romero does one, which is not as often as the other guys, it's very highlighted, it's ridiculed, it's sat on. And for me, it's just sort of like, I get it, but, you know, I'm not on Romero's case because I know, I, I feel if you put a good partner in beside Romero, you've got a very, very good partnership, just like Toby and Jan. And people underestimate a partnership in football. It's the same in centre midfield. You know, partnerships are absolutely everything in football where you understand each other's game. You know, if a long ball comes in, he's going to be the guy to head it. You're going to be the guy to sort of mop up in behind, etc. And, you know, Romero, it's clear he cannot build that with someone like Dyer or Davies or someone like that. And if you've got a Romero on your team, you need maybe that Rolls Royce defender behind them who maybe, you know, is, is not as rational as him, is a bit more calm, but is also just as engaging as he is. So for me, look, that's why I, I, I don't really get on Romero's case. Plus, Romero's 10 times better on the ball than what a Davies, a Dyer, or a Sanchez yeah. ever will be. You know, the Romero can just get on the ball and put Sonny in behind, no problem. Can Dyer do that? No. Can Davies do that? No. Can Sanchez do that? No. Romero's an all-around better player, but... We've been here before where people were starting when when Hoiberg was paired with Harry Winks. And Harry, you know, Hoiberg was going out engaging players. Harry Winks was packing his case, uh, pretending to go on holidays 20 yards behind him. And it's sort of like people are going mad at Hoiberg. You know, oh, Hoiberg's not doing this. He's jumping out, this, that, and the other. It's like, no. Clearly, you know, they've been told to get pressure on the ball. If Hoiberg goes, Winks goes. So what was happening is Hoiberg would go. That pass would be made five yards. You're looking, okay, where's Winks? sitting behind Hoiberg, you know, and that's, and then what was happening is people were starting to say, oh, Winks is better than Hoiberg, and it's like, come on, he's just not, he's nowhere near the level of Hoiberg, Hoiberg ain't at a world-class level, but Winks is nowhere near Hoiberg's level, and we're starting to see that same sort of thing manifest and play out with someone like Romero, where it's like, oh, is he as good as we say he is, blah, 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 because of the players beside him and stuff like that, I just think once you get in a, um, a defender that he can, uh, 
strike up a partnership with that somewhat wants to defend, that enjoys defending, that loves defending, and wants to put yeah. the body on the line, I think you're going to see, you know, a much better Romero. So for me, let's just stop getting on players like his back and just get on the players that have cost this club for years upon years get them out the door first before we even entertain some of these other conversations, in my opinion, because the whole idea and where I'm at with Tottenham is I want to improve Tottenham, not weaken them. He's also the future though, right? And he's, whereas Dyer, Davies, you know, Sanchez, Rodon, they're not the future. They're the past. Like they're the guys that need to go that need that about, or also have been here, you know, a long, long time, like Romero, Emerson, Dare I say Pedro Poro, a lot of these kind of newer guys that have been brought in, Bentoncourt recently, I would say they're more kind of the future of Tottenham Hotspur. So I don't want to alienate these guys. I don't want them to feel like, you know, Spurs fans aren't giving them the love that I actually feel like they deserve because I think they've established a new mentality even across the whole squad to me. I think they're a good influence on this team, a lot of these guys. Yeah, I really like the way that um, Benton Court is. I feel like he's got that passion. In like, I feel like we need a bit more of that, a bit more passion. Like Poro is quite a passionate guy, um, yeah. and so is obviously Romero is a very passionate guy. Um, so I feel like we need a bit more of that passion because that's what I kind of like Eric Lamella for. I used to love Eric Lamella, and I know he was always injured and he wasn't the greatest. But do you know what? I love the way he shouted at play, like the players when they were on the floor when he just tackled them, and I just loved that. I'm like, yes, that's the kind of behaviour I like. Sharpens his nails. <laughs> yeah, I love pitch. it. But the problem I feel we have is that what happens with people with players, they overstate them or really criticise them overly. There's never really, like, balance sometimes. They're like, oh, this player is world-class. And you're just like, mm, really? World-class? Like, you can't be thrown around world-class to every player. But then we've got players that are like Romero, and people really, really criticise like They over-criticise him, you know? And I feel like, Let's just have a bit of balance. Let's see what happens this season with him, you know, with another defender next to him. Let's not just go over the top about it, you know. I feel like people just go a little bit overboard sometimes with certain people and certain players when it's just not necessary um, to do yeah. that. Could be also because Dave and I, you know, invent so many nicknames, you know, with all these guys that maybe people just think we are calling them, you know, world class. You know, I have called Pedro, you know, uh, Poro, my, you know, my warden, you know, and I am his prisoner and maybe all that sort of stuff gets kind of confused, perhaps. But I don't just know. don't drop look, the soap. You're allowed, to, you're allowed to enjoy football, you know, like, look, yeah. I get all the problems and I get players making mistakes and everything else, but. You know, if someone has a problem with it, Pedro Porro and Pedro Porro running the prison or something like that, I mean, just smile, just just honestly go and read a comedy book or something and just enjoy life a little bit because it's really not that deep or that serious. Mia, um, thank you for a spectacular chat. Great yeah, podcast. It was, it was a banger. Yes. I hope people check this out and um let people uh, know about your channel, Spurs Between the Lines. Where should they find you? What can they find over there? Thank you, man. It was a great time. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you so much for having me, honestly. It's always a pleasure talking to you guys. You know, um, that I, honestly, you guys are fantastic. Always been there for me. So I've got a lot of love for you guys. Like I say, you're my two little uh, brothers, or Kylie and Jason, because <laughs> I used to love them as a kid. So mm -hmm. that, um, that's my new name for you guys. But yeah, you can come and find me over at Spurs Between the Lines. Um, I do different content. I do um, transfers. I have different people on. I like to hear different opinions. I do lives as well. But um, when it comes to the games, I'm going to switch it up a little bit because um, there won't be as much to talk about. But I still will be doing pre-matches, post-matches, etc. But, yeah, I just like to have good conversations with people, nice, calm chats and uh, getting to know everybody's opinions because I think it's important for everybody to have that opinion put out there as long as you keep it respectful of course that it's uh, always good to have good conversations yeah. and if you're looking for maybe some more kind of early content because you're waiting for uh, me to wake up and you know things like that absolutely go over to Mia's channel because she's mm -hmm. uh, you know early bird catches the worm she's always there nice and early she's practically have her whole day done it sounds like before even noon sometimes she's a highly efficient person yeah. so I would say check out her videos check out all the content show her some love let's also try to get her a thousand sometime soon as well because she deserves to be up there and this podcast needed to happen a while ago but I'm glad it happened you know today and it was a good one and we knew it was gonna be a good one Dave last words from you 
No, look, I, I really enjoyed this one today. I think, you know, we all had our say on all subjects. Really enjoyed it. So thank you, Mia, for coming on and sharing your opinions, as you always do. It creates and develops great conversation. So thank you for that. And everybody, please, let's get over and get Mia to 1,000 subscribers. Please hit that subscribe button. She's absolutely brilliant at what she does. And like Jack said, she's the earliest, you know, the early bird catches the worm. She's the earliest one up. So, you know, that's where you're going to get it straight away. So get over there, check it out. And I hope you've enjoyed this podcast. The link for me is channel will be below. And uh, yeah, just smash the like button. But always, most importantly, let us know your opinions on all subjects today discussed in the comment section below because we like to uh, get in there and mingle with you guys, especially if we agree or don't agree. Definitely. Everybody, we'll be seeing you. Come on, you Spurs. In the big end, we trust. Bring in some center backs. Any final words from you, Mia? Any sign off? Um, yeah, and if you don't get sent to backs, then you have to give your head a wobble, Mr. Levy, because I'm going to be after you. I'm going to be coming <laughs> and finding you to give it a wobble. That's right. See you, everybody. Everywhere we go. Yeah.